I'm Alana. And I'm Jesse, And we are making mentions. Today's the third part of our anti-Semitism series, and we're going to be talking about Jewish generational trauma everywhere from the Holocaust and beyond. And I feel like we landed on today's topic just thinking about what it means for centuries of anti-Semitism to compound upon each other and thinking of our older family members' reactions to anti-Semitism and some of the ways that they move through the world because of those experiences. Yeah, and the way it affects the movement building and Mm -hmm. the other issues that we've brought up throughout the entirety of Making Menches. I can't believe we haven't done an episode on this yet. I'm shocked. It's neat. I'm glad we're here now. Yeah. (laughs) To start off, it feels like a good place to start for us is just what is generational trauma? I feel like a lot of times that can become a buzzword and we wanted to start just by grounding us in a shared definition. As usual, all of our sources are in our newsletter that goes out every week, which you should sign up for. They're also linked in a document in our bio, but the newsletter is way more fun. Trauma in just a simple form is when a singular traumatic event happens and someone deals with the aftermath of that. Complex trauma is when someone experiences a series of traumatic events or when you've experienced one traumatic event and then new traumatic events occur. Generational trauma is a form of complex trauma. Also, another caveat, I'm a licensed social worker. So there's another source for people. And so when we're thinking about generational trauma, Uh, what's also called transgenerational, intergenerational, multi-generational trauma. That's generally defined as trauma that's passed down from people who directly experience an incident that causes trauma to subsequent generations. So while it begins with a singular, simple trauma, quote-unquote, event, it ends up being passed down to other family members and even potentially affecting like larger community, cultural, racial, ethnic groups, which can also be where historical trauma comes in, which I wanted to highlight because I feel like when we're talking about Jewish generational trauma, a lot of it is connected to historical traumas, most namely the Holocaust. Historical trauma is just referring to traumatic experiences or events that are shared by a specific group of people or community or even ethnic or national group. And it has to meet the three criteria of having widespread effects, collective suffering, and malicious intent. And the first time that we really talked about historical trauma or intergenerational trauma was among children of Holocaust survivors. To be clear, this is not the first time that anyone has ever experienced generational trauma, obviously, but the first time that it was studied and documented in a scientific and medical way was among children of Holocaust survivors. Basically, there was a study done in 1966 when a psychiatrist and his colleagues noticed really high rates of psychological distress among the children of Holocaust survivors. And this is when the concept of generational trauma was first recognized. But since its recognition, it's been applied to a variety of historical traumas and other experiences of generational trauma. Namely, when we talk about Black Americans, there is a lot of historical trauma and generational trauma associated with chattel slavery that is also really well documented. So that is the definition of what we're going to be talking about today. We also want to talk about how it works, because I think sometimes psychological concepts like this can be difficult to understand. And a lot of times it's okay, you experience something really painful and horrible, but how could that be passed down through generations? So how could someone be experiencing the impacts of that if they didn't directly experience that traumatic event? How could people in 2022 still be feeling the effects of generational trauma stemming the Holocaust if almost, not almost a century, but 80 years? Is that math? Right? Right? <laughs> I think so. Every time. Yeah, and we yeah. try to do math on the podcast. <laughs> it's just like immediate stop. Everything like comes to an absolute halt. We have to. I have to stop trying. 
Let's talk about mm-hmm. how it works really quickly. Basically, there's a few different ways that quote unquote transmission can occur. It can happen biologically, socially, psychologically, or combination of all three. In terms of the biological part, this just ha- I just happened to know the least of about this so I thought it was the most interesting the most scientific and that's not usually where my future knowledge lies but basically the concept of epigenetics is this idea that there are these potentially inheritable changes in our genome that can be induced by environmental events so things that we experience in our lives can actually change the makeup of our DNA. Again, I'm not a scientist and I'm also not a psychiatrist. So that is my like unscientific understanding of epigenetic. But basically that's why generational trauma uh, can be biological because if someone is experiencing these really significant traumatic events, aka like environmental events, like outside factors, that can actually then be passed on genetically. So generational trauma can happen through epigenetic changes, or it can also be induced through in utero exposure. So this can be if a traumatic event happens while someone who gives birth is pregnant with a child, there are stress chemicals that are released that the fetus could be exposed to that might impact future development. This comes up a lot in talking about ease, which is adverse childhood experiences. And there's just, there's a ton of study about the ways that stress, even in utero, can affect later development. And so that's how we see generational trauma show up biologically, that at least in my research. Those are the two ways that it comes up biologically. And then in terms of outside of the biological sphere, when really jarring things happen in our environment, it impacts the way that we walk through the world. And in turn, it impacts the way that we engage with our loved ones, our friends, our family, our children. So if there are really significant events happening that are producing trauma responses, that can in turn impact the way that someone is parenting a child, which then impacts that person as they grow and become an adult and for some people become um, a parent and then pass that on to their children when thinking about historical trauma these big systematic attacks like a holocaust or chattel slavery are particularly damaging because they're targeting people's core identity and traditions and these are really essential in how we perceive the world around us and the meaning that life has. So it has these really massive impacts on individuals that then are passed down through generations, especially when these impacts, not even impacts, these attacks are ongoing. So when that stress isn't necessarily just an isolated incident, but is this ongoing experience of oppression. So The Holocaust was a singular event, but anti-Semitism as an experience or hate crimes in the name of anti-Semitism as an experience are ongoing in the lives of Jews presently, as we've seen. The same way that, that even though chattel slavery may not exist now, racism is very present in the world around us and hate crimes based on race are very present. And so these forms of oppression are ongoing in their actual attacks, therefore not really even allowing a chance for healing to take place in a lot of ways. Am I missing anything there? No, I'm just learning. <laughs> I'm just sitting absorbing and learning. <laughs> I wanted to get through all that stuff because I wanted us to have a grounded place for everyone where we're on the same page about what trauma is, how it actually shows up in the body, And obviously, if this is something that people who are listening are more interested in, there is so much research on how trauma shows up in our bodies, on generational trauma, even beyond the scope of our sources. So I super encourage you to look into it. But we obviously want to talk about what this means specifically for Jewish people. So what is the connection between Jews and generational trauma? 
I learned so much from how symptoms of generational trauma show up in Jewish people specifically. And this is going to be a lot of using children of Holocaust survivors and Jewish interchangeably throughout this. And I don't know how to caveat this, that there are Sephardim and Ashkenazim who have been affected by the Holocaust, as well as Mizrahim. There's a wide scope of who was impacted by the Holocaust. And I think often when we think of children of Holocaust survivors, it's only Ashkenazi people. And so we're going to get more into the different types, but Ashkenormativity yeah. yet again. <laughs> but okay, I want to read some of these symptoms of generational trauma because I had not ever really gotten into what the symptoms of generational trauma are. So symptoms of generational trauma can show up like hypervigilance, a sense of a shortened future, mistrust, aloofness, high anxiety, depression, panic attacks, nightmares, insomnia, a sensitive fight or flight response, and issues with self-esteem and self-confidence. Again, the people who experience the trauma could notice changes in their mood and physical symptoms about the way they think of themselves and how they show up in the world. And this, I'm going off what you have here, but this is often referred to as survival mode, I think, when people say they're just trying to get through, even though there might not be a present danger in the same way that this Mm -hmm. trauma is trying to convince you it is. But yeah, I think a lot of people operate out of survival mode from their own trauma. So generational trauma shows up like this as well. And I'm really curious what you think about this resilience thing, because... I have a lot of feelings about it, but resilience is also symptom consequence of intergenerational trauma based on studies, which I saw a bunch of times when I was looking at it too, in both Black and Jewish cultures, once again, not always two opposites, Black and Jewish, but in Black cultures and in a lot of Jewish cultures, it's a history of trauma, but also resilience, which can help to build a positive sense of identity and this is often based in community and oral lore like passing accounts down from one generation to the next by telling one another when we focus on our history of persecution um our strength in overcoming those traumatic experiences is revealed which i struggle with a lot because we use this term resilience it's something we want Mm -hmm. children to have and i just don't want it to be seen as if we just get through things, we'll be more resilient. And I don't know, there's this real toxic thing that we do. I'm coming from teaching world that kids should just be resilient and survive things and get over things. And I'm not sure the way we use that in education is correct based on the studies about resilience for people who have suffered trauma. But I don't know how you feel about resilience as a term in general. Yeah. And I think we're not to get on my pedestal about hating capitalism, but I think capitalism specifically creates this lens to resilience where I think when we talk about resilience, we're talking about the ability to survive in a capitalist society. So I think when people are saying resilience, what they mean is, oh, people are able to put aside their feelings and emotions and trauma to not starve or end up without homes and that's yeah. what resilience is it's wow it's so incredible that you can survive in the face of an onslaught of oppression yeah which is like sure that is incredible but i don't think it's something that we need to look at as to be desired we should be working towards building resilience we should be working towards building a society that doesn't require resilience so Oh, yes, I absolutely agree. Because when I saw that, I was like, okay, yes, I think it's important to highlight the ways in which groups of people who have experienced historical trauma or groups who have experienced generational trauma have modes of continuing on maintaining tradition and culture through our community. And that stuff is so important. And that's so essential. But I think that can sometimes take away from the conversation about the actual impacts of the pain and harm that intergenerational trauma causes. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Okay, great. I figured we were on (laughs) similar pages. Just had to clarify. Okay, and specifically talking about the ways that intergenerational trauma can impact Jews, there's this fantastic source that we have cited specifically looking at Ashkenazi 
Jewish generational trauma from Joe Kent Katz, who runs a transcending Jewish trauma, talking about the ways that generational trauma has impacted white Ashkenazi Jewish people in the United States. And starting with the fact that we can not correctly identify threats based on this from time to time, because we, as Joe says, we miss or dismiss ways we've been shaped by our inherited trauma. We can lose track of who is threatened and who is threatening. And this can show up in a lot of different ways. She continues that so much of the trauma of our Ashkenazi families and ancestors to experience occurred under oppressive conditions where Jewish people were denied the power to protect themselves or to secure the safety of their families and communities. They internalized a sense of powerlessness and many of us in turn inherited this belief. And we actually talked about this a little bit when we were talking about Omet's love and the courage to resist Zionism, but we talked about the Kishinev pogrom back in 1903, in which it would be a pogrom that had not happened anywhere near Palestine, but was used by Zionists to promote the idea of Jewish self-defense league in Palestine that led to a lot of violence. And I think it was just really interesting to read about the impact of intergenerational generational trauma on white Ashkenazi Jews in the United States today, identifying threats that may not be accurate, and some may be, but the fact that our hypervigilance and our feeling of being victim of a crime that nobody else can understand truly leads us astray at times because mm. we are not seeing as clearly our own experience, which is terrifying. And it can also lead to inflicting pain on others, which is something we don't always talk about with the effects of intergenerational trauma because we think that we're the ones suffering, but actually it can lead to other traumas. Specifically, Joe Kent Katz says, when the narrative that comes alive is that no one else can understand the experiences we've had. Therefore, no one besides us can assess mm -hmm. our actions. They're unequipped because they didn't go through the camps. They didn't survive the pogroms. That's why they can't hold us responsible for any of our actions. And I just thought this was a really nuanced look at understanding how not to be corny but hurt people can hurt people and the ways that if we refuse to heal from our trauma we're actually going to continue to perpetuate it not only against ourselves but against other people and i thought this was also calling back to something we've spoken to before about the trauma of yemenite and mizrahi children that were kidnapped and given to white ashkenazi european jews in israel and some of them were holocaust survivors who did not have children and that is just the best example of one group's generational trauma within the jewish community creating generational trauma mm -hmm. within the jewish community for another group and so i just think we have to be careful with the way that we weaponize our experiences of generational trauma when we are aware of it and also when we are not aware of it so that's the ways that i saw in our mm -hmm. research how intergenerational trauma shows up in the Jewish community in really significant ways. Okay, all of that just feels so thought-provoking and important, and there's like so many different places that I want to go with it. Basically, I really think that anyone who's listening should definitely read that Joe Kent Katz article, because there's so much good stuff in there. But I think the first thing coming out of that is really resonating is that weaponizing our trauma or using generational trauma or historical trauma as an excuse really for other oppressive behavior is never okay. And dealing with our trauma, it needs to happen on an individual and familial and community level. It's not a free pass to do horrible things and I think something that gets so missed by white Jews and we have seen this firsthand in some of the anti-racism workshops we did throwback white Jews really truly feel like they are completely shielded from any self-reflection or critical thought and there's no way that they can be oppressive towards other groups of people because of the oppression or trauma that they experienced as Jewish people. And that's just simply not the case. And that's such a harmful 
space to sit in such really painful victim complex to develop. Because the reality is, like Jesse said, there are plenty of white Jews who absolutely have the experience of generational trauma, historical trauma, maybe even individual same simple trauma, but have been turned around and inflicted that on others. And I feel like so much of this conversation, again, as usual, is focused on white Jews. I think a lot of that is because we are white Jews. So when we're speaking from the experience of being white Jews and being Ashkenazi Jews, but this is all so much more layered for Jews of color or Jews who are not Ashkenazi Jews, like Mizrahim Jews or Sephardic Jews. And there are different types of generational and historical trauma that people who are not white, not Ashkenazi, also have to engage with. On top of trauma that may stem from the Holocaust or general anti-Semitism that isn't tied to group anti-Semitism or racism. I was just going to add the added layer of col colonization in a lot mm -hmm. of places for Sephardic Jews, for different African Jewish communities is a, a layer that we are not equipped to speak on, but absolutely there are resources out there and we have some sources cited, but I think is an area in which the Jewish world largely does not spend much time focusing. We get stuck on one type of Jewish suffering that we like to fixate on and we don't really explore other communities and how they've suffered throughout the world. Yeah. I also wanted to highlight this other part from the Joe Kent Katz article that comes right after the portion that Jesse read, where they're talking about yeah, sure. Jews on the left and other communities saying, we've got to get you all out of this pattern. You're inflicting the trauma that you carry on others in such a horrendous way. And we're actually trying to get you out of that. We're trying to get you free. That person or that group of people all of a sudden becomes part of the threat. And we, as the larger Jewish body, are ready for that. We break down the power of those dissenting voices to say that they're against us, they're anti-Semitic, they're self-hating. So just speaking to anti Zionism and Zionism being a response to, in a lot of ways, generational trauma, and in a lot of ways not, because as we talked about, the project of Zionism existed pre-Holocaust, and I, don't know, I just thought that was, as always, something that we repeat constantly on our podcast. And I also wanted to highlight, I think we have to hold the both and of the fact that, yes, we cannot, the goal is not to develop these victim complexes and not to lash out and enact trauma on others and to acknowledge the fact that we can both be traumatized and inflict harm on others and that we can recognize that reality and engage with that reality and hold space for the reality of dealing with the impacts of generational trauma and historical trauma that we do experience and that are real for Jewish people. So just that both and dichotomy existing there. Yeah. Our historical trauma, our intergenerational trauma doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in a world where other people are experiencing intergenerational trauma. Mm -hmm. And rather than being threatened by the fact that other people want to have their intergenerational trauma recognized and validated, it doesn't take anything away from the intergenerational trauma that Jews have experienced. So it's not a win-lose game when it comes to addressing trauma and healing from it. I just find it fascinating that so many white Jews within our community react that way. The only other thing I was thinking was that I feel like the not being able to correctly identify threats is so specific and really stuck with me when reading the article and when we were talking about it because I immediately was thinking of my grandma and mm. that is such to a T how she engages with her generational trauma and ongoing anti-Semitism. Constantly, my whole life always is, you can't wear a Jewish star in public. She even recently was like, you can't even walk around in New York City wearing a Jewish star. You're going to get hate crime. And I was like, I don't know if that New is York like, city. <laughs> like we're in, like in New York City. Sure. There is absolutely the possibility oh. at any point of an anti-Semitic hate crime happening, but it's just this real over amplification of a threat and not really being able to identify where that threat is coming from and where it exists. And I had just never, ever thought about that in the context of generational trauma. I had always thought about it in the context of, oh, she's just not really like fully aware and is overemphasizing anti-Semitism to further Zionism, which I do think she does. But 
I don't know, just gave me the renewed sense of empathy towards some of that to conceptualize it that way. And I feel like that may be relevant for other Jews from Jewish families. And I think a lot of this shows up in Jewish humor, which is usually like Ashkenazi, very Ashkenormative, white Jewish, New York, elitist, whatever humor that develops out of this. No one can be trusted we're all anxious we're all fearful kind of persona that gets put forward but it really does develop out of a place of generational trauma i think rather than just being funny or something i don't know i think it shows up in jewish culture in a lot of ways yeah absolutely we wanted to close off on thinking about moving forward we don't want this just to be like a lot of jews deal with generational and historical trauma and it's that because there are ways to heal from generational trauma or at least begin to engage with generational trauma. I think a lot of sources will highlight the fact that most, I don't want to use the word, I don't like the idea of like treatment cure, but coping strategies for trauma or healing strategies are derived from indigenous cultures and really focus on acknowledging the trauma that was experienced experienced connecting back to group identity and people who are survivors who have found meaning and purpose in their existence and their family and their people and these are ways that have already existed throughout history pre-holocaust outside of the holocaust that can be obviously applied to generational trauma studies from the holocaust but can be applied to healing from all different kinds of generations generational trauma. A few different sources on this in our document if you want to get into some more of them. But a lot of it just revolves around how we might address any trauma, which is like acknowledgement that it exists. I think that as a first step is it seems maybe not actually a step, but that is a step in the process. And I feel like especially with generational trauma a lot of times families are not having those conversations so at least acknowledging it for yourself but maybe even acknowledging it within your family or within your community and being like hey this exists and here are some of the ways that it's showing up for me or here are some of the ways that I've observed it showing up in my in our family are y'all having this experience too and can we talk about this together and then just general mindfulness strategies noticing what comes up in your body in response to different things whether it be like anti-semitism in the media or a friend telling you a story and just seeing what's going on and naming it and trying to connect back to what that's coming from and so really being like okay what's actually happening here what do i need in this moment um and actually trying and access what you need regardless of if it feels like oh I shouldn't need this it's not that big of a deal just having empathy for yourself and being like this is what I need in this moment and this is the boundary that I'm setting in this moment to step away from this conversation or turn off get off social media and like meditate for for half an hour or go for a walk or look at the sky or listen to an album that you really like also creating opportunities for joy I feel like this does call back a lot to the like resilience mode but I I want to like those two things because I do think that dancing joy in a community that feels like threatened constantly is really important and allows us to acknowledge that we deserve to thrive and exist in a way that that is exists in a way that doesn't center pain and oppression and trauma as the core of our being. And working with other communities who have experienced similar oppressions or who also experience historical or generational trauma to create a world that doesn't produce these forms of trauma. And so really that coalition building inter inner community, inner group work with each other can lead us towards healing. Yeah, absolutely. I had another quote here from Joe Kent Katz too, because I love the idea that they put forth saying, it's not work that we're meant to do alone. And I think that just 
in itself is so powerful that sometimes it feels overwhelming to try to take this all on by yourself or to be thinking about it alone and trying to work through it and make sense of it. But it's work that needs to be done with other people, which is exhausting in its own way, but it can be really important with the physical release in our bodies. And Joe Kent Katz says there's so much trauma we carry in our body, in our tissue, in our cells. And that means that in order to access them, in order to heal them, in order to release them, we need to go into the body and let ourselves feel physically feel where we're holding tight and have people to support us so that we can let some of that tension go. And I know not everybody feels comfortable with their body to release tension in front of others. And that's totally valid too. But if there are people who are out there feeling the physical intention in their bodies of anti-Semitism, trying to process your own intergenerational trauma, you're not alone and you shouldn't have to be alone in that. And we're working through it and we want to work through it together. So as much as you can find that community online with us or other ways, we're here for you. And it's really important to do it together and to not feel isolated. This work. Yeah. Also, it's not for everybody, but like therapy and <laughs> there are plenty of therapists who are like, trained specifically in addressing generational and historical trauma so if that's like an area that you really hope to focus on you could direct your therapist search more towards that a lot of therapy that exists now is trauma informed which is super helpful or trauma focused and so there are a combination of things that you can do to begin healing from generational trauma and historical trauma and it's definitely doesn't happen overnight but yeah, I don't know we can start to break these generational not curses but we can break these generational cycles that yeah that we that don't need to move forward and maybe it doesn't break with us but it can start breaking with us I feel like I want to end this on what do you where are times that you really feel like you're engaging with healing Ooh, <laughs> I feel that I'm engaging with healing. I am very biased. I love Jewish education, and I think working with children to solidify their Jewish identity is mm -hmm. my favorite form of healing, whether it's crafting a menorah out of some random objects or answering questions about God or giving them a chance to be really silly and play in a Jewish space and feel safe and comfortable. That is my favorite type of healing, which is avoiding the question about my own self healing but i think it does no i think that is though. the inner child right yeah i feel like it is affirming something in me so yeah what about you yeah i mean i think mine is in a similar vein to yours and i think this is just because like you're like you said before this is not work that happens alone it has to happen with other people and for me the first thing that comes to mind is creating these thought shabbat spaces yeah. and doing making yeah. benches and just being able to be in spaces with other Jewish people and non-Jewish people and observing Jewish traditions in a way that is my own and feels really special and so full of joy and hope which is really awesome yeah it was awesome <laughs> <laughs> look at us living our I values. know. Look at us. <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah, okay. That was a great session today. I hope you all enjoyed listening to us chat for a bit. We do have another session in this series. It's the final one. And the last session is going to be on processing anti-Semitism as Jews and dealing with internalized anti-Semitism. That's happening on December 28th after Christmas, but for the those who celebrate Christmas. After Christmas and Hanukkah, <laughs> checking my own bias, before New Year's. So right in between there in that sweet spot, if you're looking for something to listen to, that will be coming out. As usual, shout out to Nate for our incredible podcast music. And as we've said a million times, if you sign up for our newsletter, our sources are sent out every week by Jesse in this cutie little newsletter she creates. They're also in the link in our Instagram bio if you want to get them there, but it's way less fun. Anything to add, Jesse? No, that was beautiful. Perfect. <laughs> also, just happy Hanukkah to everyone who yes. celebrates because we are not going to be doing another episode before Hanukkah. So, happy Hanukkah, everyone. May your festival of lights be.
full of warmth and joy.